All right, I'm here with Robert Gonzalez. Robert is a longtime colleague in the world of nonviolent communication. Um, both Robert and I worked very closely with founder of uh, creator of that Marshall Rosenberg. Uh, Robert, even going back back further than me, I, I started '98. Robert before that, and um, and Robert, I've really looked to you in a lot of ways as a a, a role model in this work. Um, kind of having come before and and just the, the the quality, the depth of what of the work you do in this field, how you link it to spiritual practice and consciousness work. And um, yeah, so really you're in, in my eyes and many others, you're real, very much a, a leader in the, in the nonviolent communication community and world and as a trainer and you train all over the world. And uh, so it's a real honor and pleasure. And I'm just grateful you were wanting to do this with me, be in this conversation. Um, and uh, yeah, and we're going to talk about both, you know, that sort of consciousness level, but also two things that are really important to Marshall that you and I know is how much Marshall talked about social change and the social political level, the systemic level of things, how, how much that impacts us, how important it is to focus on that. It's not easy to know how to apply what we do at that level, but given what's going on in the world and politically, I think it's so important to that people like you and me are talking about that and, and then bringing that out into the world as much as we can. So, but before we go into that and, de and, and cover those topics, do you want to say a few words yourself about kind of what you do and any other ways you want to orient people to, to you? Great. Thanks, John. I appreciate the, you know, your introductory um, sort of sharing. And I'm, first of all, I'm really delighted, really happy to have this conversation with you. I, it's one of my favorite things to do is to talk, connect with colleagues that where we have a, a shared sort of vision um, for how we want to contribute to life and how we want life to uh, be more fulfilling. And so I have a long time, uh, it's, it's hard for me to pick a label, but one who has valued this process of nonviolent communication and bringing it into the world to enhance my own life and other people's lives. So. I met Marshall Rosenberg in 1985. So I've been around for quite a while. And it, over the course of my evolution in integrating this process and in my work, it slowly evolved into um, what I found was what the essential component, the, the essence, the foundation of all of this. Uh, and it, it boils, it kind of, um, came down to calling it the spirituality. Uh, the, you know, given that this is a construct and it's not easy to fully understand because there's so many different, I think, interpretations or takes on what spirituality is for each person, hmm. that I have, uh, I don't have a better way to open the door that this is the area of consciousness and living that I found that I find to be the most valuable for me and and I find it the the desire the impetus to share this on this level is what is the most meaningful to me mm -hmm. so and my work has evolved and it continues to evolve uh, over many many years I, I can't imagine that the depth of my um, learning and growth will would stop at any time because that's the nature of life as I experienced it, the nature of consciousness itself. So, yeah. So yeah. Really happy to be here. Yeah, me too. And uh, yeah, we'll 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 dive into those areas, and and uh, hopefully people can get a lot of rich understanding as we as we explore that together, and then connect it to the to the social as well. Um, so. Yeah, actually, so let me just say, again, reminding of the, the topic of these, I like calling this conversations about consciousness, communication, and civilization. So not just kind of the current social, political, but you know, how that relates to 
where we are as a civilization, even just to, to really have a very broad and deep look at, at those three areas, uh, consciousness and civilization, how communication, the kind of communication we do plays in, into that and can support um, those areas. Um, and also about evolution, ecology, and, and global health. So those are all the topics that for me are really intertwined and, and important to sort of talk about and, and, and um, yeah, get clear on and, and, and share with others. So that's really the purpose of this. And so Robert, um, in terms of your, in terms of your work, and as you were saying, how it's been evolving for you. I, I notice, like the times when we're together, it's uh, it's very expansive for me. It's almost like like I take hallucinogenics. Sometimes I feel like when we're talking, and you're you're going into some of the depths of of how you how you're evolving this work for yourself. So I'd like to start there, and and sort of what consciousness means to both you and I, and in kind of more specific level as it relates to communication. So to, for people interested in how we both, you know, hold that, because my, my experience of it is that, you know, communication can be very technical, you know, and, and these people learn nonviolent communication in a way that often very just language based and, you know, putting things in the form of observations and feelings and needs and requests and very kind of, and, and sometimes that comes off very mechanical and formulaic and off-putting actually to a lot of people. So to me, so crucial in, in this approach to communication that's about a certain quality of connection and a, and a more, that universal, holistic, kind of beyond, a transpersonal sense of, of connection and, and how communication can be a doorway into that and the communication, the components of it can be very much about different levels of mindfulness or consciousness and, and, and as a way to get maybe unstuck from the kind of thinking and worldviews that we get limited by. And, and that, you know, I see as human beings on, on the civilization level, maybe, or the evolution level, trying to get to some new place. We're hitting all this massive crisis points, whether it's the climate, politics, health, and, you know, the, the, the coronavirus that's still raging on. So all these sort of crises, existential even, crises we're facing, and then this, I think, call to humans to sort of evolve and leap to some new level. And um, consciousness, I see, is so like integral to that. Maybe some would say, that's it. That's all about how we evolve our, our experience of consciousness. But I'm curious if you'd be willing to start with just your take on, you know, what is consciousness? How does it relate to communication and this work we do? Um, and why is it so important to individually, but also maybe just collectively and where we are as, as humanity? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's a huge question. <laughs> I love it. And I, I guess it's a daunting question, so to speak. It begins because for me, there's so many, it's a multidimensional sort of question. And, and I see it as an inquiry into um, what is the nature of consciousness as I'm hearing you talk about it and, um, and how is it related to uh, communication, meaning human being to human being communication, at least on one level. Yeah. From the very beginning, when I started my own journey in my lifetime uh, as an adult, it became the highest value to become conscious somehow there's a seemed a natural impetus within some aspect of my being to become more conscious meaning to be more awake mm -hmm. to be more present and mm -hmm. somehow that's linked to the the quality of the capacity to live the way somehow i'm I meant to live mm -hmm. and that that's my first sort of response there's many different levels another one is the way I experience consciousness and therefore I define it is that consciousness on an individual level as a human being is different than consciousness that is beyond the individuality um, defined as individual human beings. Mm -hmm. For me, consciousness is the very substance of existence. Mm -hmm. 
it is that container beyond any um, beyond any definition or constraints of time, energy, and matter, and this, the limitations of past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. So it's outside of time. And then as consciousness exists uh, sort of in and as and through the human being, for me, I, I, my experience is that consciousness is our very identity, that who I am at heart in, in the very core, the essence of my being as a human being is I am consciousness. Mm. And so what I've often share is this concept of the unfolding of consciousness um, through the heart uh, that connects to the deepest longings of the heart are actually the vibration of my essence. Mm. And my longings translate in a very practical manner into what NVC has shown me as these universal human needs. So as a human being, um, and I, I share this, not only a belief, but an intuition that all human beings um, share the same needs, the needs for love, the needs to, for freedom and freedom to choose. That these aren't something that we want to accomplish, um, but that they are an expression of that part of our nature, that because it's our nature, it, it's, it's pushing on us to emerge. So it's a natural emergence, not so much an, a, a goal, an objective to be, um, to be realized. And so if my longings, the fundamental longing in the heart of consciousness as a human being, as I experience it, is for love. Mm. And as though love is the image, the metaphor that I've often used that's meaningful to me is that it's like a multifaceted diamond. It's all the same diamond. But sometimes love shows up as my longing to be seen. Sometimes it shows up as the quality and value I have to belong and for belonging. Sometimes it shows up as wanting my freedom to choose to be seen and acknowledged. All of those, those qualities that in NVC we identify as universal human needs from, from this perspective is an expression of my nature. And as I'm communicating with you uh, in this moment, I, I see this also as, as, as an emergence, that what is it that we're going to experience together and perhaps even people who are listening to this message um, the, it's emerging in the field of interbeing. Mm. So the interbeing field, it, then it starts, to, then the spirituality begins or is emerging into the field of relationship and the relational field. So if I'm to, from this perspective, see that my individual human, the being, beyond the personal identity, the essence of my human being, if I see this as a structure, um, and then I see a different structure as you and, and me, the relationship structure of a human being of the I and thou, mm. the purpose of, of this life force that emerges from all of us, through, the, through all of us, is so that the structures can be a conduit for this energy, for this consciousness, for love, mm. for fullness, for freedom, for creativity, for all of these qualities is that when the uh, radiance uh, emerges within me, then I'm living this. When it emerges between us, whenever there are moments of just to make it practical, if you're in a state of pain or distress or confusion, and I meet you there, and there's a moment of, of touching you and me together in this space, mm. 
And there's a quality of care and kindness. There's a quality of, of being seen and regarded. Wherever that, in that space between you and me, whenever this quality emerges, for me, this is the emergence of the divine. Mm. This is the moment that you and I can incarnate the divine in the space between you and me. Mm. And so um, then there's other implications for, um, given that I, as a subjective uh, being, call that my essence, some traditions call it the soul, mm. is one dimension of reality. And another dimension is the interbeing, the intersubjective reality of what arises when there's a, a conscious me and a conscious you. Mm. The possibility of, of. I want to use more than just the word connecting. Hmm. Uh, uh, it, it's is that ultimately there's a possibility for communion, hmm. where the apparent separation becomes unification, hmm. and it's a differentiated unity, hmm. because it, your your identity, your individuality doesn't dissolve. Mm -hmm. It's simply differentiated and allows us to play and engage. And then there's another structure that's a little bit more that you made reference to it as, as I see it. And one is the structure of the constructs, the uh, collective constructs that exist on a different dimension, sort of this collective consciousness. Mm -hmm. This for me brings forth a, a tremendous um, challenge for how do we as humanity, how do I as an individual, how do we and the groups, perhaps that has shared values, bring forth this consciousness so that the very structures of the, uh, of the collective become conduits for the divine also? Mm. How does a given political um, structure, a given financial structure in life, a given with all the different structures in life yeah um the heart of what i the value of, of nvc that it points us to is that everyone matters mm. is that everyone has ground value there's no one individual or group that is more valuable or matters more than another mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if i use this if i can live into this as the guide then this is the guide that will support me in there's any efforts that I want to make in terms of supporting the transformation of these structures and collective, um, whatever that collective structures are, mm. um, I want to have this as my guideline, mm. that we all matter, that, that we all want to be included. That, uh, all pieces of the divine, that to, to yeah. not lose track of that in those structures, that they don't take us away from that. Yeah, yeah, I said a lot of words, so I uh, just want to give you some space to uh, respond. I'm curious. Yeah, how yeah. How you're taking this in. Yeah, you did cover a lot of ground there. And, you know, what you said towards the end, I'm really, I'm looking forward to just exploring that together uh, as well. Like, because there's so, you know, as we see the the current in the United States here, but a lot of other countries, we just see the politics playing out in very tumultuous ways. So anyways, the, how, to, how to take what you're pointing to and bring it into the reality of how difficult this, these things are. But anyways, I, I wanna focus first on the, the, the first part of what you talked about. And yeah, you, 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 know, you said a lot, but let me, let me see where I, can, uh, where I would go with that. So maybe just to reflect back a little bit as we do in our work, right? Let me start with that. that so as you're responding to what for you consciousness is, I heard you talk about sort of the personal level of awareness, just being aware and mindful and that sense of a kind of subjectivity of that though, the subject object sort of duality of our own awareness, but really how we can develop that ability to be more present and aware. Um, and then you talked about consciousness as something much vaster than that than the, the sense of being an individual. 
and and so what you said that matches my own journey with this is is that something very powerful in shifting that sense of identity maybe is a word we could use or some perspective about who we are and what reality is from just being a kind of separate isolated self to identifying with something much much vaster that is um that that is you call it i think you said sort of the like the essence the substance of everything so the idea that consciousness is the ground maybe of of matter and reality it's like that there's this kind of everything is essentially consciousness taking different shape and form and i think that's you were saying something along those lines and then kind of how you see that flowing through through the heart and emergence and love and needs and the interbeing and the relational so as i as i hear you talking about it it's it's like how do we humans kind of navigate our own personal experience and relationships with others and the larger world but like in a way that like um that that kind of shifts some ability to to know or understand like relate to what what's going on you know how do we relate to experience itself in some different way that like opens up much more possibility of well-being and and joy and right and 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 uh but also of i i don't know maybe you could speak a little bit your experience of when we make this kind of shift and and using you and i using kind of these um the structures having to do with communication, nonviolent communication, but as a, as a kind of vehicle to, to get to this very expansive understanding of consciousness and who we are, what we are, that it gives us some power, some different power in the world to, to move, to create, to experience different levels of well-being, something like that. Like that's kind of coming to me. If you want to go a little deeper into what, what does this give us? This, making these distinctions, having practices that bring us more and more into what you're talking about, what does that give us the ability to do? Um, yeah, I, I like the question. And uh, uh, as I take the question in, my own experience, my own understanding is that is, uh, I can only speak a lot in terms of metaphors, is that if we look at this particular process. And of course, there's many other processes that, in, that are intended to enhance the well-being of, of, of a human being, is that it can be seen as a pointer. It can be seen as a guide. Mm. That as, and it is a construct that helps me guide my consciousness and my experience. And as I engage in this guide, in my, the inner landscape of my experience, it guides me into a communicative reality with you. And what that does is, is it, it's, it's, I would use a language slightly different. It's not that it gives me the power, but that it reveals the power that is already mm. here. Mm. Yeah, 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 I like that. Yeah. It opens the door for me to connect to that which is already my power. Mm. You know, the tradition of nonviolence, uh, particularly with Gandhi, um, the, the, the Sanskrit terms, the two Sanskrit terms, ahimsa, ahimsa, and satyagraha, and, uh, excuse me, um, if I, rem I don't, if I remember the meaning of these two words, ahimsa is, is, is non-harm, mm -hmm. which is similar to non-violence. Satyagraha, sat means the truth, the power of truth. So uh, this is, can be related to the term uh, truth power or soul power. Mm -hmm. So the force that emanates from the essential of who I am as a human being is the very power of life. Yes. And this is what these processes awaken within us. And when we then we are truly empowered, which, which means that then I'm truly connected with the power of my being. Mm. Shared powers, when I, in a relational space, can connect with you and see you through your needs 
that the essence of you is compassion. The essence of you is freedom to choose. And when I recognize that, then we live in an empowered space together. Yes. This yeah. connected space, that space that is often used, maybe some people think it's overused, quote of Rumi, is that there's this field and this field that we meet is, is a condition of our being that is beyond the concepts, the dualities of right and wrong, good and bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's when we meet, this is what empowers us to engage life in a creative way to create the conditions of life that are different than what we have now, mm -hmm. create different possibilities. Uh, rather than trying to dismantle systems, can we create new systems that emerge from reality? Yeah. So this, to this, this is the, the essence of at least how I, how it's meaningful to me, sort of how I can articulate what lives in me. Yeah. So. Yeah, so power through us, the power that's already there, that, that if we have these kind of distinctions, practices, frameworks, that that power, as Gandhi talked about it, and other, that, that can really flow through us to create new possibilities for, for well-being, for connection, for new structures, new, new ways of doing things. Like, so yeah, that, that how to access that power of life the life force that uh, so that yeah i love the way actually you talk about that um that's really inspiring to me actually uh, the way you the way you speak of it um and you talked about systems you've also talked about yeah this and we i like that we kind of keep touching into this larger systemic level of things and how to because I think a lot of people right now, myself included, how do we, yeah, access that power and then how that power can flow into what's needed in the world right now, given all these massive challenges human beings are facing. Yeah. To, and I think you're, you're speaking to that. I can hear it in your, like you're, you're um, referencing that and like kind of indirectly, like given what's going on, especially now, how do we have the power? How, how does that power flow that, that can, get us to some place that we actually maybe don't destroy ourselves and the rest of the planet. Um, you, you talked about lack and I mean, not in this conversation, we've had other ones where you talk about a sense of like we experience normally as, as individuals and humans, a sense of, of lack of, of separateness, but that, that one around lack actually you've talked about in a really moving way to me in the past. And, I think it's very much related to where we're at right now in the conversation uh, and how the systems that we currently have are very focused on lack and being frightened and being adversarial and competitive in ways that we, uh, you know, create all this unhealthiness. So do you want to speak a little bit to like what this way we're talking about can open up possibilities around a sense of lack or, or not lack? Mm, yeah. Yeah. This is, I, I, you've named it for me a really important component of how we can approach, I mean, trying to reframe what I heard you say is, uh, how can we connect to the actual power that we are as human beings with each other? So having power with, that can be that, that place from which we then engage in life. Mm -hmm. And then for me, how that's connected to lack is, let me see if I can do this in a succinct way is, um, when I, as an individual human being, am confronting life that is difficult to experience, because what's in front of me is something uh, that is where there's it's pain, people are suffering, there's distress in the field. Fear, um, lots of fear, right? Fear. fear. And how I take that in can be one in which uh, it stimulates fear. It stimulates powerlessness, hopelessness, helplessness. Mm -hmm. When I'm in that state of being, I'm not in touch with my power. Mm -hmm. That state of consciousness is the very heart of lack because the mind hears it as there's something wrong. I have to fix it. Mm -hmm. And what the mind usually does, what the being does in consciousness 
is react in three different ways. One is, is a sort of withdrawal. I'm, I'm afraid, I'm helpless, I'm powerless. I don't know what to do, so I withdraw. When I withdraw, I withdraw from my own capacity, my own power. Mm. Or I aggress in judgments. I become judgmental, evaluative, even if it's um, intellectually or academically um, analytical. Yeah. That, that doesn't necessarily help one connect to their own power. Right. And so the translation process, the transformation process, and this is the nature of the primary impetus of the work that I do, is how can I, it answers the question, how can I as an individual human being, in the face of the events of life, in my community, in my relationships, connect to the power of my being. Mm. What that entails is the capacity to transform how I am receiving life, mm. transform those obstacles in my consciousness that primarily take the form of the conditioning, the messages that I've taken in, the indoctrination from my educational system and the culture um, and the traumatic experiences of my life that reside in an unrecognized, unconscious part of my being. So when I take these difficult situations in, it reactivates those elements in my system. And as long as I am, I, I'm either withdrawing in fear it, it's that classic fight, flight, or freeze responses mm. that my nervous system and my body and my system is conditioned to react in that way. Mm. All of those reactions can be seen as a fundamental, fundamentally acting from lack or what's wrong or the deficiency in life. Um, and acting from that deficiency, as long as I'm doing that as a consciousness, then I'm not in touch with the sufficiency or the wholeness of my being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I'm able to heal individually and we heal in relational safe spaces, then we begin to, to restore our true power as human beings. We, we begin to reconnect with the very substance of consciousness, which is love and care. Mm. And we share that in spaces with one another when we create the space to listen to someone else that has a completely divergent life view, perhaps from a political, social, cultural, or perhaps if I'm dealing, if I'm connecting with groups of people that have been wounded in relationship to the culture that they live in. Mm -hmm. When we create spaces where individuals feel trust and safe, then those wounds are able to be expressed and be heard and received. In that receiving, the person receiving it and the whole community is, rest we're restarting to, rest we're beginning the process or continuing the process of restoring our wholeness and our mutual empowerment. Mm. So that then we can move forward in what I used to call, I remember this image of these islands of cultures of aliveness can can we create these cultures of aliveness so that we become empowered in these little bubbles or islands around the around the world because there are i think there are millions of these that the and it's not it's not i mean nbc is just one sort of one way to get there. one way one flavor but i think there's millions of groups of human beings that are in their own way creating these cultures of life mm. Mm. this for me is what gives me hope because when i look at the condition of life and what's going on it's easy to stimulate fear and hopelessness and powerlessness yes then i lose my own power yeah. When I imagine that I can meet other human beings in the space where we value each other, where we matter to each other, where we listen to each other, we start to create a different culture. And these cultures of aliveness are the only hope that I can see of how this can translate into how we organize ourselves in systems as human beings. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, I love the way you, you put this. Um, so power and healing of trauma and ways that we get disconnected and triggered into the fight or flight system. And I just want to keep circling back to this idea of lack because it's, I find myself personally, I kind of get it intellectually, but I find in my emotional body, my deeper parts of me really so programmed or so conditioned, as you said. So, you know, and, and, and it's in the wiring of, you know, being, animals in the world and, and facing suffering and death. And, and there's, that's a real level. But when I, as I hear you talk, it's like this potential we have to, yeah, we can acknowledge that level of reality, but we can also access something where another level where there really isn't lack, right? So that's, there's something about, I, I, the, you of course know, I know you know the concept of spiritual bypass, by, bypass uh, because of that article you sent by John Wellwood. Um, but so it's easy to kind of slip into that. And yet I think, yeah. you know, you're, you're pointing to something very, very real, a, a dimension, a realm of experience that's possible for us where really it's, there isn't that sense of, of, of lack of, of not enough on one level, obviously there can be, but on some other level, this power you're talking about um, that's the power of that wholeness. Some call it non-duality as a, as a kind of duality, non-duality, but I don't know. Can you say anything more like in, in your approach to more, is there anything more you want to say about how, how to get to that place where you're not so caught in fear and lack and, and um, that that seems so real and palpable so often um, so yeah, anything more you want to say, just coming back to that, like, how do you do it? How do you get there? I love the question because for me, this question really opens the door to what I see as the very essence of what is possible to transform life. Um, and so for me, the first, the body of work that I, that is connected to nonviolent communication that I teach, that I share is called living compassion. And it means I live compassion, uh, which means that's the very heart of everything that I do moment by moment within myself and in my relationship. So the first thing is from compassion is a state of being. It's a state of being conscious and an, an embodiment. So if I am experiencing or for another person that I'm sharing with and inviting this possibility of experiencing lack, how I meet that lack is I can meet it by resisting and denying it, therefore spiritually bypassing it. Mm. I can transcend it. There's lots of techniques for me to learn to take, to transcend it and cultivate other states of being that seem to be relatively free from the lack. Mm -hmm. The approach that I take is Whatever arises in my field, I bring compassion to it. So that if I am in a reactivated state in relationship to an event in my life, the, the approach is the invitation to, as I receive this stimulus that comes into the inner field of my being, mm. can I allow it to be there in my space? I'm not denying it. I'm not pushing it away. Mm. But I, the, the language is to allow it, mm. to let it be present, to give it space to be. Mm -hmm. Because when I do that, then I'm beginning to start to cultivate my previous identification and stuckness in that reactive state itself to the compassionate witness, the compassionate observer, that then begins to open the possibilities how this contracted experience can begin to unfold and heal and restore itself. So any experience of lack, I want to first recognize it, bring my attention to it, my breath to it, recognize the certain components to it. One of the primary components of lack is contraction. My thoughts are contracted and narrow. 
my emotional reactive emotions are narrow mm. my physical sensations become contracted and the energy gets pushed down held tight mm. it's, uh, sometimes um, it, it's it, my body feels numb these are all forms of contraction mm. the intention is to um, cultivate the state of first observing the practice of mind embodied mindfulness observe what is arising as as my reaction mm. give it space mm. cultivate an inner empathy because this is a very this at the heart it's a wounded part of me that is revealing itself in this moment mm. and what it wants is to be seen what it wants is to be held now as i go through those layers it can be quite difficult to be with the intensity of what comes up my reaction comes fear anger intensity so the tendency is to fuse with that and to continue to enact that conditioned or traumatic state of being that's arising mm. the work of inner compassion begins to transform that possibility as i continue as i begin to cultivate this capacity to first let it be within me can i give my reactive state space the nvc principle has guided me with in this or actually it's emerged as a kind of synergistic understanding is that when i'm when i create a state of inner empathy with these parts of me that are judging the parts of me that want to run away that want to hurt mm. the parts of me that are feeling intense pain mm. then i'm creating an inner listening space that allows this contracted component to begin to relax because then that part of me eventually starts to heal very often through grief mm. Mm. the pain that's been held mm. in whatever part of that system begins to release the fundamental core need in in these wounded states that are held within this core lack is i just so long to be seen i so long to be given the space so that that i have the sense that i matter that love that you talked to that before yeah yeah so so this is the the essence of the nature of the work and for me how this experience of lack uh how i could frame it as this is the human part of me the conditioned part mm -hmm. that i've learned what is right and wrong mm -hmm. i've learned that there's the other if you look different than me <clears throat> then somehow you are the other and you're a threat yes Yes. This kind of indoctrination into human consciousness yes. that has served to separate us and separate me from my own heart yes. it continues to carry on on these systemic levels. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So what's really um, intriguing to me is uh, I was kind of focused on like just the way life can be at a certain level of, yeah, we are mortal, we can die, like sometimes there's not enough food or whatever. But like, where you went kind of was like the ways we carry trauma and deep kind of wounding, whether it's from our own direct traumatic experiences or it's just culturally, systemically collective. And there's actually right now, I th you may know of the online summit, I guess it's the second or third year of um, called Collective Trauma Summit Online. A guy named Thomas Hubble is organizing it but it's like all about collective trauma and generational trauma and all these ways that we don't maybe appreciate how much trauma we carry on multiple levels and like you're and you're saying like yeah if you bring compassion and presence and healing to that that goes so far in in getting beyond the just being caught in this pattern of lack and fear and reactivity so it's not like you're saying by doing the, by focusing that way, it's like there's this ability to just sort of acknowledge some of these realities at a certain level, but then free us to, to go beyond that. If we, if we can be present to this, this wounding 
Yeah. Could you say a little more like once we do that, then in your approach, like going anything, like where does that take into in terms of get what, what does the place look like and feel like in your experience when you're not really caught in that perception of lack anymore? You're, you're, you're in some other space or field, as you've said. Yeah. Can you, you want to say anything more about that journey once you've kind of been with this hurt that's arising or fear or contraction. You want to say more about that? Yeah. Um, I do want to maybe go back to at some point uh, after I share this part of it around what I heard as lack in terms of how we lack of food or lack of anything. Yeah, please do. I would yeah. take that in. I'd like to bookmark that. Okay. Uh, but I think if I understand your question is, for me, it's an ongoing process. It's not so much, well, once I, I, right. You know, You're just there all the this, time, right. Then yeah. I'm there all the time. For me, it's a continual ongoing Sorry, processes God. of taking in life, metabolizing it, hmm. uh, exploring it fully so that at the heart of all of the contractions, the experience of lack, the, where my mind says there's something wrong, um, I have to make it right. Um, at the heart of that is, is always this sense of the unfulfilled needs and the unfulfilled longing of my being. Mm. When I touch that energy, say, say I touch the part of me, it's very often this turns, this becomes a sort of healing of those young parts. Mm -hmm. these unhealed parts are i often call i often call it my, the wounded innocence of my being mm -hmm. so when, when i can connect to the wounded innocence i'm embracing that part of me that has that has longed to be seen to be to feel care mm -hmm. longed for the quality of love longed for belonging when i touch into the energy of that longing <clears throat> it carries a quality. The energy of being seen and, and understanding, it carries a quality. That quality itself is the quality of my being. When I embody that energy, then I embody the power of my being. Mm -hmm. And the more I do this work, mm -hmm. the more I live from this energy. And, and this is oh, a way... There's no lack in that energy. Is that no lack in there. It's, mm -hmm. it's always, there's no fear in this energy. Mm. <clears throat> and there's no attachment to outcome mm. Mm. in this energy. Yes. The, yes. And so, so when I have <clears throat> cultivated this to a certain extent, and this has been very relevant for me in the current events of the, of the COVID pandemic, the limitations and even more recently in my area fires, yeah. the fires and the air quality for seven or 10 days was mm -hmm. toxic and hazardous to the health, yeah. in, in which I, you know, and so it's easy for the, for my conditioned mind to say, this is horrible. This is terrible. And, and uh, what's wrong. And I feel powerless and helpless. And, and it doesn't, it doesn't mean. So if I'm, to receive the experience of this without resisting hmm. and um, really allow this to come into my being. Mm -hmm. Very often what I feel is grief. Hmm. The body feels this natural grief. Yeah. The emotions feel grief. Because what I long for is, is a sense of the flow of, of breathing freely, which is a quality of the radiance of freedom itself in the body. Mm. When the external conditions are not aligned with that, the most, the most whole, full um, quality is to enter the state of being, is grief. Mm. Grief restores me into my wholeness. It doesn't deny the reality of life but it takes it in so the shift from fear to grief. Like that's a really yeah. important shift. Yeah. I transform the fear with compassion. Yeah. 
you know, I want to make sure that my fear, there's not, doesn't mean that there's something wrong, that I'm doing something unspiritual or yeah. anything like that. But I, I embrace fear. That fear is some part of my being giving me a message about something very important to pay attention to. And then it transforms into grief and then from grief beyond into other things too. But that important step of going into the grief uh, be, be underneath or behind the fear, the contraction. Yeah. My grief is always a link to what is precious. Mm. If I don't consciously connect to what is precious, what is prized, what really matters, not simply as an intellectual meaning of it, but feel what is precious to me in the energy of it. The, what is accompanying grief is, is always for me a quality of tenderness. Mm -hmm. and the quality of tenderness is holding the embrace of love in the midst of this painful experience. It's a sweet pain. It's a tender pain. Marshall would call it a sweet pain, yeah. Yeah. And, and for me, grief is just as much, it's, it's a part of the fullness of life, part of uh, the spirituality, just as much as joy and celebration is. Mm. And they're, yeah. they're intertwined. They're, I can't imagine living wholly without, mm. with, without the grief of, of, of being alive. Living holy, yeah, yeah, and you're making yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm associating to the work of people like Francis Weller, soul work, grief work, Joanna Macy. The the so important to drop down into those depths, as well as then maybe getting to some transcendence, but not. But the bypass is if you, I think, if you bypass what you're talking about now, yeah. If you you try to get around that because it's too painful or uncomfortable, you try to go straight to the transcendence it's really missing it's not there's something very important um, absolutely getting skipped over there so yeah i really really i'm so glad you're talking about this grief for me is the doorway mm. to wholeness mm. it's not well you have to feel grief and then oh then you can feel joy and fullness for me it's it's a little bit different than that way for me it, it's the portal let me see, like, I want to combine what you said about the, the power that, can, that flows through us that, that where there isn't lack, and yet there's this, what you're speaking to so beautifully about grief and really dropping into the depths of that. Um, like they go to, they, they, they're, not, they're not either or there. There's something about both this fullness of that, of that, power of being of life itself of consciousness to come back to that word consciousness itself that's kind of this unified ex sense of thing and and at the same time being able to be with this grief and healing of the pain inside so can you anything about how those integrate what, what that the connection between those two um, I, I like the question and i'm um it's hard for me to imagine them not being integrated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I can imagine it only when I'm aware of my own conditioning and what is a huge conditioning in the culture. It has to do with, with what we've learned, I think, in a, in a general way, is our relationship to pain, mm. particularly emotional pain. And this is connected to the trauma that we've experienced individually and then collectively as well. Mm. Our relationship to pain is such that we've learned to stay away from it, mm -hmm. to avoid it, to deny it, to push it away. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's, it's con I'm not sure if conflation is the word, it's conflated with physical survival. Yes. The body says if you feel pain, the natural survival instinct is to move away from the perceived threat or danger so that your body can survive. Right. And, and when it gets translated into psychological survival, then it starts to um, affect the quality of my being able to feel this energy, the sensation of emotional pain itself. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I actually really like these. It's hard to imagine that 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 sense of maybe the the wholeness, the fullness, the power of life flowing through us that isn't also intimately connected with that grief. That 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 to me was really um, like that. I could really see like yeah, how, those aren't separate. Those aren't right. That, that was cool. Um, you wanted to go back to that bookmark, and then I also want before we run out of time, I want to get to even more fully focusing on the the social, political, we've been touching on it, which is, yeah. cool, but to yeah, even go more fully there. But do you want to go back to that bookmark? Well, I think I made a quick reference to it. Okay. I think, that you, I think um, if I understand you were talking about, uh, correct me uh, or clarify for me, you said, well, there are, I think I heard you say, well, there are these things in life yes. that can be easily be seen as lack. There yes. isn't enough justice. Uh, there isn't enough uh, caring in life. Um, I don't have enough food. Where's the money going to come from? You know, these things that on a sort of common sense and logical level can be said, well, that isn't fair. Yeah. And the needs that I have for sustaining my life for the value for fairness and all of that yeah. isn't present. And I think that that's what you were referencing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So then are you saying from what you were saying, just saying earlier, then is it something like, yeah, being with maybe the grief of that instead of the fear of the lack of it, but just being with the grief, then that's a doorway into back into the flow of this larger expansive sense of who we are. Is yeah. that? Yeah, that's, that's the way of framing it. Uh, so I want to at least touch base on it because this isn't, I'm not trying to, talk about or espouse this perspective of of there is there are no conditions in life right. that i could say are there isn't enough food there isn't the food that i'm needing there isn't the shelter there isn't the quality in the culture that i want to see i'm not denying the reality of these things i'm, I'm really talking about how do i take this in that i can fully take it in without judging without resisting it and fully connect into through my grief through the power of what I can then bring to life. Yeah. So, so the so. qualities of the, the needs, the love that, and then how to meet it, the, the energy of meeting those somehow that, that that's the way that to not get caught in it in that, in that yeah. more limited sense of things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, um, I, I think that does lead into the, the the social systemic level of things what i might say even the, on the civilization level i don't know I'd be curious if you concur with what i'm about to say but there there are many talking about like joanna macy and others that like that we're in, as a civilization we're in this sort of collapse phase not just america but the whole western civilization or the world like the, this whole way we've constructed our economic systems and governments and everything um, is, is sort of collapsing in a way and the way climate is changing and the environment is being impacted and polluted and ec ecosystems uh, suffering and kind of buckling or looking like they're about to. Things like, like, so that the grief of the state of things and um, yeah, so, but in terms of bringing what we're talking about into that level of, maybe you could say, what do you see? Do you, do you kind of have that sense of where we are kind of as a human evolution, trajectory, civilization, and how things are the symptoms of that that are arising, particularly visible at this time? Um, and then, yeah, anything about more about like, yeah, this, how this, approach we're talking about how to how to bring it out on that larger level anything yeah uh yeah i mean i i just want to qualify my responses i, I mean i'm taking in your question as this huge huge uh question encompassing this reality that we are all all facing globally that is so enormous yes uh, and, and and actually has so many unanswered questions and a lot of theories around it uh, a lot of social theories, a lot of political theories, a lot of spiritual theories, maybe. Mm. And so I feel really humble with respect to it. I, I don't have an answer. Mm. Uh, 
I, ha I have the sense of the possibility of what we can do as human beings. And, and it has to do with, um, you know, it has to do with what can we, what are we as human beings empowered to do? And, and it has to do with creating these connections with, with other human beings, creating communities. These bubbles of life, you, a yeah. life you talk yeah. about. Uh, and it's, there's, it's so complex. There's so many different systems. There's so many yeah. different cultures and subcultures and groups yeah. that there's a degree of complexity that I have. It's like enormous. I have no sense of yeah. what I can do. I have my own little focus of my work. Mm. And, and what, one of the things that, I mean, one of the models that has helped me is the, uh, the work of Ken Wilber and mm -hmm. just to make quick reference to without getting uh, too much into it is this, his four quadrant um, a model of, of reality, these four quadrants encompass all of reality. And in earlier part of our conversation, we talked about the subjective, which is one quadrant, which is an interior subjective. Mm. And then the, and then the intersubjective is another quadrant is that field of relational space where we share our subjective realities. Mm. And then there's other two that are objective, which, which is, this is where the, the systems are are constructed the infrastructure of life mm -hmm. and this is the visible objective system yes. of life and it seems that so many of these systems carry with it these uh, subjective of of i'm going to call it legacy of how human beings groups of human beings have always dominated other groups of human beings yes. through colonization Yes, the inherent sort of of what of privilege and supremacy that is carried in these collective cultural movements. Yeah. So now, what's going on? What's been going on for decades, uh, and more recently, is coming to a head. Is this kind of these events in life are happening in the U.S. Uh, many events with uh, the death of George Floyd as as is these are people are beginning to wake up to a crisis and it's very painful mm. it's enormously painful and traumatic to see these but the well the energy that's coming up is the well the energy of see me i matter mm. um and can we the first stages is the is the pain the trauma of these kinds of events Mm -hmm. You can see this happening on many levels on climate change. Yes. And, and so then there's these periods of trauma that are, can be seen as awakenings. We're, we're beginning to awaken on a level that we, I believe we haven't necessarily globally. Then after the awakening, there's another stage of let's touch into the dreams of what's possible here. Mm -hmm. We've awakened to the shock. Of, of all these different levels of these traumatic shocks of happening culturally and, and globally, climate wise. Yeah. So can this awaken the dream that can move us forward? Yeah. And then out of these dreams, collections of human beings can then create strategies of action for acting. I'm just sharing with you my own kind of theory. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, go, run, run with it, it's great. And these strategies for me, unless they contain creating dialogical spaces i don't have any hope at all for the transformation of what is wanting to be birthed or restored in our existence mm -hmm. the dialogical spaces of groups where we can begin to listen to one another particularly those with divergent approaches to life and understandings mm -hmm. this for me there's the, lies the only hope in how we can create not by dismantling systems, but by creating new systems. Out of the dialogue, out of the... Out of the dialogue, yeah. out of the dream. Yeah. Uh, how we can create collaboratively new systems. You know, I, I think one fairly good example of that is the possibility of restorative justice, mm -hmm. restorative systems, and how that might eventually, hopefully, 
gain strength and momentum so that it transforms the existing punitive systems of justice. And so these are just some ideas in my head that I have around what hope do we have as human beings to actually, we need to take a look at and admit that there is, um, th with the labels of you know, white supremacy, colonization, privilege, all of these can be seen as judgment, but they can also be seen as we need to look at these. Yeah, systems and patterns. Of yeah. What I've, I've realized I've been doing an awful lot of talking here, and it's not... Oh, and so, uh, yeah, not so much of a conversation. I, I'm really open to hearing if there's anything um, in you that you are inspired to share as well. I, I would love to hear that. Yeah, well, it, it, as I as I hear you saying what you just did, what what I've been thinking a lot about is is Gandhi. You referenced Gandhi and nonviolence, and the maybe he talked about it, this combination, yes, of focusing on what you know the dream he was holding for India and how to create that and keep focusing on the creation of something new. Um, but he also, as, as we know, what he's even more famous for is how he resisted the, the British, the empire, the colonization, the domination system. So it seems to me it's both, like it's some way to not cooperate with the current system that's, that's, that's uh, oppressive and dysfunctional and unhealthy and isn't honoring each other as humans and all that, right? So how do we, but how, how do we skillfully, you know, and how Martin Luther King brought that into the civil rights movement to not cooperate, to not support, and at the same time, do what you're emphasizing, finding these, these bubbles of, of people who want to engage and create something new and, and just, and maybe I have the image I have is the bubbles get interconnected all around the, the world and and that, and I think Marshall kind of had a dream about that of the syner synergic. He had a certain way he said it, something about synergic partnerships and things of people that would do that um, somehow. So both seem really important to me uh, in my own my own thinking. Um, but I guess yeah, it, it made me tying it into the first part of the conversation, communication, and how individually we can tap into this certain kind of perspective and a power that is bigger than us or sh shift or to identifying with that. Um, but it's like, yeah, how to bring that into the, the, lar the, the, the conversation on a larger level, right? So you talked about the three levels, they're in, with ourselves, interpersonally, interbeing, with kind of our social uh, interpersonal connections. But then how do we bring it? You know, I think Marshall really struggled with that. Like he, he had such a passion for it, but you know, I had a sense he never really quite figured out how to go there, how to get there, how to actually support this way of communicating and linking that up with these two kind of not cooperating and supporting something new. Um, so that's where it's just a big question mark for me. Uh, but I got some images as you talked about, yeah, these dialogic forums. But um, yeah, but I, it's like this big unknown for me still emerging how to support something happening at this so social level. Um, but I, I don't know if you have any more thoughts on that as we're kind of starting to wind up our time together. So, I Well, I pretty much resonate with this, what I heard from you was, uh, how do we do this? How, how do we implement it? And uh, I, I think it's important that you acknowledge the, the approach that Gandhi and then Martin Luther King uh, took, and there's others also, about nonviolent resistance, nonviolent non-cooperation. Yes. And I, I think it's important to acknowledge that this is a, a really important um, Possibility is really important. Something that it is a way of engaging, mm -hmm. not 
nonviolent part is really important because the nonviolence is a state of being, it's a state of consciousness. It's not simply refraining from, it's partly refraining from violence, but it's, but it's the challenge is how can I and how can it happen on a more collective level that people are able to actually understand and embody the state of being when violence has subsided from the heart. Mm -hmm. This is a huge challenge. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do this. I have no idea how to implement this. Uh, yeah, you mentioned satra, satragaha, soul force. Um, um, so to embody that, it isn't just abstaining from violence. It's something much deeper yeah. and, and then to do that collectively enough that it makes a difference yeah yeah and the many dimensions again i mean it's it's like um i think to acknowledge i, I think there's many many thousands maybe tens of thousands of individuals and groups of individuals uh with initiatives that are in alignment with uh, social justice with um, you know justice for the for the planet for the you know for um, restoring our wholeness to the climate and it's important to know that a lot of this is already going on yes and 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 then there's this conversation that's going on through the internet uh, in this cultural space and I, I just hope I would just and my hope and my wish is that these conversations can be more humane rather than polarizing. Yeah. And uh, edu the education part of this is, a, is an important step. How can we bring these conversations so that we actually are in this cultural space of the conversations and really listen to each other rather than degrade one another because my view is different than your view. Right. So, I mean, I was just touching on all of these parts, these aspects of what is necessary for us individually and collectively. And it has to do with these dialogical spaces out of which our collaborative working together emerges. And this, I actually, uh, before we end, I have one other related topic to this that popped into my mind if, if you have the, the energy for it, which is government. I, you know, say just our current government, I have a, a judgment that it's fairly broken and, um, and, 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 and the possibility uh, arising that we could, we could lose democracy and, 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 or even more so if, if we had it before, we're on the verge of possibly sliding into a different kind of uh, government system. But the, 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 so, the, I mean, do we, what's the role of government? Is the role of government to provide basic needs? You know, I, I don't want to get, obviously, this could be a whole another huge conversation, but just to touch on the, you know, where do we focus our attention, our energy, and maybe you or I don't know, but to me, it's, a, it's an important question. It seems like it can't be left to corporations or, you know, it seems like the a unique role of, of a democratic government really well functioning to take care of the basic needs of the people, the citizens. Um, and so how much energy to try to reform government and have that happen? Or, or is there some other way? Um, or just kind of abandon, like it's totally too far gone and broken and it's about creating the new and just focusing on more resisting and, and then and creating the new. So do you have any thoughts around it's kind of a wonky, you know, technical question in a sense about democracy and government. But any last thoughts on that before we close? Um, I may have a couple of thoughts. I mean, everybody has their opinion, so I don't think it mine's any more valuable than anyone else's. But I, you know, I really question: uh, How do you define democracy? Do we actually have a democracy? Right, right. You know, what's the heart of democracy? And whatever, if I understand the heart of it, you know. We have perhaps maybe the closest in in many different cultures in many different countries 
to the democratizing spirit where every individual human being is valued and all the systems and structures support that individual valuing. Mm -hmm. I, given our current government, that's not happening, obviously. Right. So, um, and, and I forgot what famous politician said that the best form of government is democracy. And even that is a poor structure for how we can organize human beings. Mm. So something I, I'm probably butchering that quotation, uh, but it's how do we organize these groups of human beings that we call our leaders that can decide and choose that these are the people we elect to choose or decide for us that will be be in support of the spirit of democracy, that we all matter, that we all can be included. You know, um, I don't have an answer to it, but I, uh, my sense is that we don't live with the spirit of democracy. We live in a particular structure that's called democracy with the systems that are, you know, pretty much fatally flawed in terms of how we elect our officials and yeah, the role of corporations, these, money, and all that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the lobbyists and how corporations are are mixed in with the political fray and yeah, it, it's yeah. So yeah, that's a huge. It's a huge question, but I, I like what you. But just to pull out the thread that you touched on that there's a, there's a spirit of democracy and that maybe you know there's something even beyond whether we call it democracy or something else that that just a what is a new way that's actually much a structure that can hold that spirit much better and that allows us to be much more adaptive and healthy in how we relate to ourselves, the environment, to, to just living in a really healthy, sustainable way on this planet. Like the spirit of, of what, what structure can better or best as we can get to and uh, hold that spirit. Yeah. And maybe that's going to be even called something different or who knows, but I, I don't know. I like that you opened that possibility in just what you said. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I really like what you said around just the, the essence of it. And yeah, it can be the, I don't know, something we can focus on uh, as, as, a, as a collective that can keep us moving forward. Yeah, the way you framed it was, it was really open and because we all have these associations to democracy and government, but maybe that's, that's too limited given what, what's needed at this time to respond to the challenges we face and to, 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 to kind of embody that dream you talked about, the dream that's in so many of us of, maybe all of us at some level, what, what could be, as Marsha would say, more wonderful, having life be more wonderful for each other. Right? So Robert, thank you. Well, any, before I start to kind of close us, any last things that you didn't get to say that you wanted to, or are you feeling complete? Oh wait, lost some volume for you. I'm hearing you quite. There. Okay, you're back. I feel as complete is as I possibly can. I think my <laughs> connection's a bit unstable right now. Yeah. So uh, I've enjoyed um, the conversation, and um, you know, I'm hoping that whatever can come from this conversation, whoever views it, that this can be one more sort of couple of voices in the larger conversations are, that are going on everywhere, yes. that it can somehow contribute in some way to offer different perspectives and somehow that can enhance the larger conversations. So thank you, I appreciate your inviting me to do this. Well, you're so welcome, Robert. It really is an honor and privilege to, to uh, do this with you and I'm very grateful for your time and what we talked about. Yeah, I have that hope too that this it will add to the conversations already in the world that are trying to talk about this and get to get to the places that we were talking about. Um, anything you want to say about how people can find you if they want to? Any, any, uh, we will put that in the notes for this, but anything you want to say? Um, well, other than, you know, my website and uh, given the limitations of the pandemic now, I seem to be offering primarily online programs programs. Uh, and I have one coming up starting October the 20th on uh, 
the spirituality of nonviolent communication, where I'll be sharing many of the things that I brought up here. Mm. A six week course. So just wanted to mention that if people would like to follow through on some of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's that's about all I have to say. Thank you, John. Yes. Okay. Thank you again, Robert. And I'll turn off the recording here.